blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. The word of the Lord. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 19. The call to victory. And uh, I love the word of God. It's, without the word of God, you'd never get past first base ever with anything. And um, it's, it's quite a call that God has placed upon us. It's very serious. Um, it's, um, and Sunday I'm going to preach a part two to this called The Culture of Victory. I have it in my head, but it's not on paper yet. Um, but we're talking, going to be talking about victory God's way. Um, and victory is tied to sacrifice, and victory can lead to death. Um, so, <laughs> so just so you know that, it's, it's not a sissified gospel. It can, lead, it can lead to death so that a harvest can be reaped. And uh, it, le- it does lead to death, the dying to self for the most part. The call of God is a dying dying process, die to self, die to everything ar- around you so that God can use you for great things and accomplish great things. And we're going to talk a little bit about Saul and of Tarsus who became Paul. And uh, I love this call. This is a, an amazing call of God. And um, it's really, uh, there hasn't been enough teaching and preaching about the sacrifice, the commitment you talk about commitment, you can empty a church out real quick. And I'm glad you're here tonight. You're committed. You're here because you're committed. Amen. You're here because you've, been, you've uh, committed to the call of God. You're committing to go deeper into the things of God. You could be doing a lot of things tonight, but you're here. And uh, that's the important thing. And maybe this will bring, bring a little clarity to your call. A little clarity, maybe bring some peace to your mind, your heart, to understand what he's calling us to do. And, uh, and we really need to have an encounter with God. Amen. Sunday, I really, really amazed. I was an awesome service. Um, Sunday, the worship was incredible. Um, I hadn't been seen that level of worship here in this place before, uh, which is a good sign. It's a great sign that, that God is moving. I had an email from a guy this week who uh who said that uh he's convinced that there's a move of god here he's been here a couple times he's watching the internet every quite regularly he's taking all the messages online he's put them on youtube uh feels that they'd be they get more circulation on youtube so we don't know what is going on out there in if that website is wild and uh and he's also talking about putting it on itunes he's also talking about getting podcasts and is, this is a, a man that lives in Saskatoon. So, so anyway, uh, so fine, go ahead, you know, whatever. You know, we wanna, we wanna, he he's really wants to get things going and, and, and use the Internet for, uh, for God's glory rather than the devil using it for his garbage, right? And so it's a good thing, and if you're watching on, if you're joining us on the Internet, we welcome you here, and uh, we're, gonna, we're getting the messages online quicker now. We're gonna. We he wants us to stream also, but the the system in Cineboy isn't very good for streaming right now live. So we we stream we stream, but we don't stream live, and we're going to soon if we can. And uh, you can get it going if you want to pay the money. But anyway, uh, if we can get it on next day or day after, it's it's good too, right? So anyway, Acts chapter nine, verse one to nineteen. It said, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he, he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecute you why do you persecute me who are you lord saul asked i am jesus whom you are persecuting he replied now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do the men traveling with saul stood there speechless and they heard a sound but did not see anyone saul got up from the ground but he, when he opened his eyes he could see nothing so they led him by the hand into damascus 
For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he, and he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. And so, the reason I, called, entitled, I entitled this The Call to Victory is, is that he calls us to a victorious, glorious kingdom, and that right here on earth, not, it's, the call isn't just so that we, we die, we can go to heaven. Amen? I think we've got that point in the last few years. It's not just a call to give your life to Jesus so that when you die, you can go to heaven. It's a call to have victory. It's a call to be victorious. It's a call to take people who are really very ineffective in anything and turn them into vessels, instruments for God's glory, instruments of victory. Amen? And so, remember... Saul, Saul was Saul of Tarsus. If you guys know the story about him and and how he he was a religious zealot, he wanted he was a a Pharisee. He wanted to he thought he was doing God's work. And a lot of people think they're doing God's work, and really, a lot of time people think they're doing God's work are actually killing His work. And but he was a religious zealot, and uh, he, remember the story of Stephen how he got in an argument with the religious leaders and he, you know, he really got them mad and they got so mad that they decided to kill him so they stoned him, you know. And I, I love Stephen. He was a man of God. He, nobody could argue with him. I love that. Nobody could argue. <coughs> nobody could win arguments with him. He was just a common, <coughs> a common man who was filled with the Holy Spirit and he did amazing things he was a table he waited on tables amen so if you're a table waiter you can do great things amen he he did that he, he waited on tables and and they said that nobody could argue with him he, he did great exploits for god but when he got <coughs> he got into argument with the religious leaders they got ticked off and stoned him and killed him <coughs> and i like how he took that too he had a call to, to be a victor, right? And so they're stoning him, and, and as they're throwing rocks at him, big rocks to kill him with the intent to kill, he's, he's praying, Father, don't hold this sin against them. I like that. I like that attitude. <coughs> you know, we have somebody say something bad about us, and we, oh, man, we're just devastated. You know, and we, you know, we, we get depressed, and... We go, oh, we might as well quit. We might as well give up. All that stuff. We're just devastated. It's just such a persecution. But Stephen, he knew his call. He knew what he was called to. He knew he was called to preach. He knew he was called to, to serve. He was called to do whatever God called him to do. And he did it with great joy. He even took the stoning with joy. Right? I like that. Amen? Taking stoning. Just think of that. Think of that for a moment. It's incredible. Um... And so he was going to, he was trying to stop this movement called The Way. Uh, basically, the, the, he was trying to stop the church from, from growing and becoming what it is, what it is today and, you know, what it's supposed to be anyway. Um, so he put people in jail and he, he watched, he watched over the stoning of Stephen. And I like verse 3, it says, 
as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And in verse 4, he says, He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So really, this is, if you want to pray for something, if you want to pray for people, pray that they would have a road to Damascus experience like Saul. Because when Saul, no matter how arrogant or how rash he was or how confident he was, when he got into the presence of the Lord, everything changed. He was not, his boldness left, everything left. You, you want somebody to get right with God, pray they have a, 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 an encounter with the risen, with the resurrected Jesus. <clears throat> you know, it's not going to, programs aren't going to win this society. Programs are not going to help you. You know, um, it's, it's it, the encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and so, he also shows in the scripture here how he says, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? It shows, it tells me something that Jesus feels everything that his people feel. He feels everything that we feel. He, if people think that some of the, they feel disconnected from God, that God doesn't really understand. What, but Jesus, he understands. He understands how we feel. He understands what's going on in our, our culture. It's not so much... Uh, physical or anything, uh, persecution like that, it's a lot of mental stuff that goes on. The mental attack will hit and discouragement and all that stuff. But he, shows, he knows that and he feels it. And this man was going and trying to stop his church and he wasn't going to let it happen. He wasn't going to get his way. Saul he always got his way. Nobody ever told him what to do or what or how to do it. He just did what he was going to do, and that was it. He was very, he was very uh, confident and very brash. Verse five and six says, um, uh, Saul says, "Who are you, Lord? Who are you? I'm Jesus, who you are persecuting." Notice the connection again. You're persecuting me. What are you talking about? <laughs> And Saul's so thinking, well, what do you mean? How am I persecuting you? You know, people that mock the, the church and mock the people of God, I wonder what Jesus is going to say to them. Something similar to this, I think. And he says, I'm, I'm Jesus. You're a person. Now get up, verse 6, now get up, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. He is not, in the, no, I love this. He doesn't say, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to show you what I would kind of like you to do. And then, if you feel comfortable, go and do it, okay? Okay, Saul? That's what sometimes we make Jesus feel, sound like that, some of our teachings. Oh, just if you, if you, you know, if you kind of, you know, I, oh, I don't feel comfortable with that. I don't think Saul was very comfortable at this point. He's laying on the sand in the noonday heat in the Middle East. He just got bucked off a horse. And he's, he says, there, he says, you go there and you'll be told what you must do. What you must do. A must is a must. It's not a suggestion. <laughs> it's not, it's not a, anything like that. It's a must. You, this is what you must do. And you were a persecutor, but now there's going to be something different come in your life. Verse, verse 7. And there's lots of people doing things they shouldn't be doing right now, but they're going to have an encounter with the Lord. Sooner or later, they're going to have an encounter with the God. But this is a, this is a no option call. This is a must. And he, does, he calls us, and uh, I guess as part of the problem is the preaching. It's kind of like, you know, if you come, you know, come as you are, whatever, you know. Uh, you know, he loves you just the way you are. Well, it's true he does, but he's, he ain't going to let you stay with the way you are. Verse 7 says, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Did you notice here the bystanders had no say? They had no opinion. They had no idea. 
The call was hidden from the bystanders. The call was hidden from the bystanders. They, were, they had nothing to do with it. They had no option. They had no, they had no say in what was taking place here. And they had no idea what was going on. That's why a lot of people don't understand you. Because uh, y'all, everybody that's in here right now has been called by God. And a lot of people don't understand you because they haven't heard the voice of God. They haven't heard the voice of Jesus. But as these bystanders had nothing to do in the outcome of Saul's ministry, neither did the bystanders that are saying, I don't understand you, or whatever. They got nothing. It's got nothing to do with anything at all. They've got no say in this. They don't have an opinion. They don't have a vote. This is the call of God. He is calling a man and he's doing it his way. And I like that. He called me and he did it his way. Right? I don't fit into most religious molds. As I don't know if you've noticed that. But I don't fit into that mold that people want to put me in a lot of times. So it just doesn't work. But they can't, the call in your life, nobody can know what's in your heart. Nobody can understand. When people get hit by the power of God and they're on the floor, nobody can really know what happens down there, except the person that's happened to. And people say, I'm judge. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. It doesn't matter what you like. This, this is God's. If, if you were calling somebody, would you buck him off a horse? Throw him in the sand? Blind him? That's not prim and proper. That doesn't fit into our books. That doesn't fit into our call. We, we, God would never make, look, make anybody look foolish or anything like that. Do you ever hear that one? God would never do that. God would never hit somebody with a power and start shaking. And, uh, this guy lost his sight. And they had to lead him. to. They had to lead this bold, brash man to a place where he needed to go. Amen? God will do what he wants to do. And he had to do the drastic to, to break the religious mold of this guy. He was a Pharisee above, above all Pharisees. You know? He was a religious zealot. He, 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 wanted, he, wanted to, he wanted to do what God wanted him to do. He wanted to do the things of God. It's just that he didn't know God. This is the one slight problem he had. Verse 8 and 9. So Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. For in verse, yeah, in verse 9, for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And this is, this is the call. The call of God, lots of times. Listen carefully. When God calls you, it will shake you up. It will shake you up. There'll be times where you can't eat, you can't sleep, you can't do nothing. When he says, this is what I want you to do, it was like, whew. He does, whew. Everything, Paul thought, everything I've done. He's sitting there thinking for three days, he's in this room, he's blind, he's sitting there thinking, Everything I've done in my life is wrong. Everything that I've been trying to do for God was wrong. It's, it's been wrong. You ever go through that? I have. <laughs> I have that. I've gone through that. Everything. The last three years has been a reevaluating of everything. What, what, what is it? And he's never, ever, ever intended to make it this thing easy for us. It's difficult. And we're going to get into that in a few seconds here. In verse 10, uh, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. I love this. This guy had a relationship with God. It was, it was so close. He was, he's just, he's, here he is. He's, here's Ananias. He's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about Jesus. He's connected with God. He's a trustworthy man that God can trust. And he goes, and, and he goes to him, he, and he calls him. He says, the Lord called him in a vision, and Ananias, 
Yes, Lord, he answered. We just write, right, yes, Lord. You know what most people say most time? I'll think about it, Lord. I'll think about it. I've got I to gotta pray about it. You won't hear me say that very often. Once in a while. But when somebody asks me to do something, uh, I don't have to sit and think about praying, especially when it comes to servanthood or something. When somebody asks something, needs help, whatever, I, I, and all of a sudden the Lord says, dude, I don't, I don't need to take days on end to pray for something that I know that he wants to do. <laughs> Amen? I, I, I don't have to do that. And somebody, you know, and um, that's the way it is. And that's the way Ananias was. Verse 11 and 12, and it said, The Lord said to him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus. He gives him all the details. Ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. He's praying. What's he praying? I'd like to know what he was praying. You know, you ever think about that? You, when you read this stuff, do you ever think that way? What was this man praying? And some, the Lord, he'll show you right away. And, and I'm thinking this today. What is he praying for? Verse 12 says, In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him so to restore his sight. So he's praying, Lord, I want my sight back. Can I let me see again? And I'll do things your way from now on. He, right away, he's, pray, he's praying for healing. He's praying. I believe that's what he's praying for. He's praying. And, and, he, sees, he, and he sees the answer to his prayer in a vision. He sees the answer to, uh, to his prayer. He sees in a vision. There's this guy, Ananias, is going to come, and, and he knew the name, everything, and he's going to come and lay hands on you. And so the Lord prepares the message for the heart and the heart for the message. So in this three days, God's preparing this man's heart for the message. And it's an awesome message. It's a great message. He's going to be healed. He's going to be delivered. And as Ananias has some concerns. And verse 13, and it says, For I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. There's nothing wrong with being concerned. There's nothing wrong with having conversations with God like that. He has this conversation. And, and he, he's not arguing. He's, just, he's got these things going on in his head. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the Lord. Verse 15. Um, 15 says, 15 and 16 says, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. The, great, the greater the call, the greater the suffering. Wow. Isn't that something? You think about this, the great call. Um, the more you die, the greater you harvest. So, he says he's going to suffer. So why? You know, what, what's with that? Is it so that Saul, who becomes Paul, will look good before men? Is, it, is that the reason why that he's got to suffer so that we can talk about it 2,000 years ago? Oh, it's, Saul was an incredible man. Our Paul, you know, Paul, he was an incredible man, wasn't he? And, but that's not the reason for the suffering. The suffering happens because you carry that name. You carry that name. That name that's above all names. That's why you suffer. That's why a lot of people don't want to carry it. Because, you know, th this is the name. This is a name above all names. And there is a... He, you're carrying that name into a world. You're carrying that name to a people who are hurting, who are dying. They have no hope. They have no peace. They have no life in them. It's the only hope for them. He's the only one that can help them. And you're carrying that name. Do understand this. You're carrying that name into a war zone. You're going into a prison where people are held post hostage and you're carrying that life of freedom with you. There was times in Saul of Tarsus, or Paul, the Apostle Paul, when he became Paul, he had nobody stuck with him. Nobody. 
He had not, nobody left. But what did he do? Did he, did he cry and say, oh, you know, those wicked, evil people? No, he just kept serving Jesus. Kept writing letters. Kept focusing on Jesus. Oh, I'm the only one left. You don't hear him say that anywhere in the book. He says, no, I've finished the race. <laughs> he said, I've fought the fight. I've finished the race. Too many people, oh, they all left me, so I guess I can't finish the race. What does that have to do with anything? Get off your butt and start running. Yes. Yes. Say amen. Yes. Okay. Get with it. And we say, oh, we've had such a hard life. You know, I, I get self-pity creeps in on me, too. Yeah, I've got such a hard life. Well, Paul suffered greatly. Let's see what Paul went through and see if this matches up to your tribulation, to your trials, to your storms. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22. So here he says, are they all Hebrews? So am I. He's talking, he's comparing. So are they all Israelites? So am I. Are they all Abraham's? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. Okay, so he, he's just out of his mind. That's okay. He says, I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent the night and a day in the open sea. I always want, well, that's a... A night and, and a day in the open sea. That must have been fun, eh? <laughs> Can you imagine the joy? But, but he's, he, he, he's not complaining about it. He's just saying this is a fact. I've been constantly on the move. Constantly on the move. Constantly on the move. I've been in dangers from rivers, in dangers from bandits, in dangers from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city. I think he's been in trouble many times. In danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brother, brothers. <laughs> Whoa, isn't that something? I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Wow. So there you go. Has your troubles matched up with Paul's? He suffered greatly. How did he do it? How did he manage to do all this stuff? Well, number one, by grace, by divine influence. The divine influence of God came into him on that road to Damascus, and in, when he got prayed for, he got filled with the Holy Spirit, and his divine, the, God's divine influence come upon his heart, and it's a reflection in his life. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit, but numbered, you know, the mo one of the most important things we always forget about, he was committed to the call. Committed to the call. He went through everything he did because he was committed to the call. That, old, that no option clause there, you, this is what you must do. On the road in Damascus, he was told, what you must do. There's no option. This is the way it is. And I, I, that's the way I'm, I've been living my life. I didn't come up with a deal for God. You know, people say, well, God, if you do this for me, I'll serve you. If you do that, I'll serve you. If you, you know, you're making deals, you're bargaining, you're doing. Saul never had no bargaining authority at all. So this is what it takes. This is what you're going to do. This is what you must do. You're going to suffer greatly. Prepared his heart, right? He didn't do it based on feelings or emotions. He did it because it was a must. A must is to be obligated, to be necessitated. It's expressed, it, it expresses both physical and moral necessity. And, and so... It's a must. It's a must, 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 must. You must, you must, you must, you must. Jesus he does, he makes it clear. He makes it clear. He doesn't give you the, uh, the um, option to be wishy-washy. And wishy-washy people are always miserable, always unhappy. 
never ever satisfied with nothing. He says, this is the road you walk on, stay on it. Thank God I've always been around men and, and, and women who have challenged me that way. All the way through my walk with Jesus. Um, you know, you think about Saul, or Paul, I'm thinking... It's confusing now when I'm Peter Paul's song. But it's the same guy. So bear with me. But when he was in the, po- in the prison, um, after, you know, they set that girl free and they did this miracle and they got arrested. They got thrown in jail. They got stripped of their clothes. They, they were naked. And then they got beaten. They got beaten. And all that stuff. And yet, you know, he... he they. He had uh, open wounds in a dirty prison in the inner cell, which is dirtier than ever. And he's in this place, and it's horrible pit. And and he's he's in this place. They throw salt water. They used to throw after they lash him. They would throw salt water on their wounds so that the maggots wouldn't build up. Uh, interesting scene. But they, they would do that. So all this, he's, he's, in, he's in prison. He's stripped of his clothing. He's, la- he's bleeding. He's lacerated. He's broken. He's helpless. He's unconscious. He's in, insensible. His back is ripped open. And they throw this water on him. And, but this is the price of apostleship. This is the price of the call of God and his service. If you want to have happiness, walk in this. Walk in this no matter what. No matter if, if you're abandoned by everybody, you're going to serve Jesus. Because there's, when you encounter him that way, when, if you've never had an encounter with God, you should be praying, Lord, let me encounter you like that. Let me encounter you. I've always, I pray like that. I want to I encounter God in a more real, real thing every day, not just once in a while or just at a service once in a while. Oh, I'm going to go to California next week. and I'm gonna, I want to encounter him all the time. And I have several times, and that's why the call is for, for me. There's no other option. This price that you pay. God, God said, he shall bear my name before Gentiles. He shall bear my name before Gentiles and before kings and the children of Israel. He qualified as God's messenger. He shall bear my name. He shall carry that name. And when you carry that name, guess what? You got a big target on you. <laughs> How come it, everything is not going right? You know, I'm reading uh, Pastor Bob giving this John G. Lake book, his, his sermons, and it's like that thick. And I started reading that, and oh, my goodness. And now I see why he had 100,000 healings in Spokane and, and stuff like that in Africa. And oh, it's just incredible. But in this book, he's talking about there was a great move of God in South Africa. And he, tell, he talks about the reason for it. And, and um, I'm going to read you some stuff here in, in a few minutes, in a couple minutes, that uh, right out of the book. And, but basically, 125 men went out on the, on the mission field. And they were a very young organization. And uh, they ran low of money because of a demonic assault upon the ministry. Uh, they didn't have email back then. This is in you know, the early 1900s or whenever it was. They didn't have email. They didn't have any of that stuff. They didn't have, you know, they, you sent a letter. It was going to get there next year, right? The South Africa is a long ways away. It's a long way to fly to South Africa. Never mind ride on a boat. And, and so they're out in this mission field, and, um, you know, people say, oh, they run out of money. They must be out of the will of God. You know, something goes wrong for a preacher. Oh, they must be out of the will of God. Something goes wrong in your life. The devil whispers in your ear and says, you must be out of the will of God. And you believe it. Well, how, you know, it was better before when you didn't serve Jesus, and you believe that trash. But, you know, and, and so... Here, you know, they, they say that. It's, you know, they must be not of the will of God. But, you know, they were running. They had no money coming in. 
and uh, John G. Lake, he, he did not want to leave them on the field in that condition without the money. And so they had a headquarters. The people at the headquarters, they sold their clothes, they sold furniture, they sold everything they could to bring the guys in off the mission field. They, did, they, they sold everything to get them off the mission field. And, and, and they wanted to get them back into the, tell them, uh, bring them in and have a conference. We're going to have a conference together. We're going we're gonna to tell you there's no money. There's no use going back into the field. You can't survive. And they're talking about this. It's drastic. There's no money. Like, it's not like today. Like, if you had, there was no food. There was nothing. And said, so they had these 125 men. They gathered them together. They said, this is the way it is. I want to send you guys home. You know, I want to, we're going to stop doing what, we're, we're not going to go out into the mission field anymore until we get the money. So they said, could you leave the room for a while, Mr. Lake? Could you leave the room? He says, so they left, he went and went to a restaurant across the street, had a coffee. They called him back and uh, they said, um, uh, they, they called him back and he said, he, they, they went back, he says, um, we're going back into the field. We're going back into the field even if we have to starve. They gave up their wives. They said, even if our wives die and our children die, and if we die, we're going back into the field. That's our decision, and it's final. They had no money. They just had one request. If we die, we want you to bury us. They said to Dr. Lake, if we die, we want you. The next year... He buried 12 men and 16 wives and children. And these guys went without food. They went, they, one of his preachers was sunstruck. He had a sunstroke and he wandered off and they tracked him. They followed his, his blood from his feet. Uh, they followed and they traced him by the blood marks of his feet. And you look at that and you say, well, that is irresponsible. You know, they lost... 12 people, 16 wives and children. That's irresponsible. Why would you give it up? Well, the result was 100,000 native South Africans were saved. 1,200 native preachers were risen up. 350 churches were planted. And John G. John G. Lake says, the way, the way is no easy way. He says, the way of following Christ is not an easy way. And I'm going to read you some of this stuff that just <sighs> it shook me. And I, I'm going to quote you this from one of his messages. He says, I'm not persuading you, dear friends, by holding out a hope that the way is going to be easy. I'm calling you in the name of Jesus Christ. You dear ones who expect to be ordained to the gospel of Jesus, Jesus Christ tonight, take the route that Jesus took, the route the apostles took, the route that the early church took, the victory route. Whether by life or by death, historians declare that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. Beloved, what is... That is what is, is the difficulty is in our day. We have so little seed. The church needs more martyr blood. If I were pledging men and women to the gospel of the Son of God, as I am endeavoring you to do tonight, it would, not, it would not be to have a nice church. He's not calling us to have a nice church and harmonious surroundings and sweet do-nothing time. I would invite them to be ready to die. That was the spirit of the early Methodism. John Wesley established a heroic call. He demanded every preacher to be ready to pray, ready to preach, ready to die. That was what he sent them out. He taught them. He says, be ready to preach, pray, ready to preach, and ready to die. That is always the spirit of Christianity. When any other spirit comes into a church... It is not the spirit of Christianity. It is a foreign spirit. It is a sissified substitute. I thought I invented the word sissified. Here it was a hundred years ago. He said, listen to this. 
He lived, I lived on cornmeal mush many a period with my family, and we did not growl. And I preached to thousands of people, not colored people, but white people. What he meant by that is he didn't have a lack. All the other people were going, all his other 125 men were going out to the missionaries. He sent them, they were going out, they went out, they're preaching, and he lived on corn mush. He says, when my missionaries were on the field existing on cornmeal mush, I could not eat pie. My heart was joined with them. That is the reason we never had splits in our work in South Africa. Our, our country where Pentecost never split. Pentecost never split. The split business began to develop years afterward when pumpkin pie eating Pentecostalism, Pentecostal missionaries began infesting the country. Men who, are rare, men who are ready to die for the Son of God do not split. Oh, they do not holler the first time they get a stomachache. Bud Robinson tells the story of himself. He went to preach in the southern mountains. It was the first time in his life that he had no, no one invited him to go home and eat with him. So he slept on the floor, and the next night, and the next night, after five days and five nights had passed, his stomach began to growl for food terribly. Every once in a while, he would stop and say, Lay down, you brute. He'd say that to his stomach. Lay down, you brute. And he went on with his sermon. That is what won. That is what will win every time. That is what we need today. We need men who are willing to get off the highway. When I started to preach the gospel, I walked 20 miles on Sunday morning to my service and walked home 20 miles in the night when I got through. In the night when I got through. He preached from morning till night after walking 20 miles. I did this for years for Jesus and souls. In early Methodism, an old local preacher would start Sunday Walk all night, then walk all night Sunday night to get back to, the, to work. <laughs> it, was it was a common custom. Peter C Cartwright preached for $60 per year and baptized 10,000 converts. Friends, we talk about consecration and we preach about consecration. But that is the kind of consecration that my heart is asking for tonight. That is the kind of consecration that will get answers from heaven. That is the kind God will honor. That is the consecration of which I pledge Pentecost. I would strip Pentecost, Pentecost of its frills and fall the rails. Jesus Christ, through the Holy Ghost, calls us tonight not to an earthly mansion and $10,000 motor car, but to put our lives, body, and soul, and spirit on the altars of service. All hail, ye who are ready to die for Christ and this glorious Pentecostal gospel we salute you. You are brothers with us and with the Lord. Pumpkin pie eating Pentecostals. Wow. When I heard that, when I read that. Oh. Think of it. Think of that. Think of the call. That's how serious it is. That's the call. That's why a lot of people don't have nothing to do with real Christianity. But let me tell you, it's the only thing that's satisfying. It's the only thing that's satisfying to walk in 100% obedience to Jesus. <laughs> you think that kind of preaching, what he preached, I read that book and I, I, it shakes me. When any other spirit comes into the church, it is not the spirit of Christianity, it is a foreign spirit. And so this call that Saul had that turned to Paul was an incredible transformation for his life. Was he fulfilled? Absolutely. I, I, I can't wait to meet the man someday. This is going to be awesome to sit and talk with these guys. And, you know, and they're going to they're gonna want us to share our story. Yeah, we suffered persecution. Right? Yeah. Father's Day was raining, so we couldn't have our picnic. <laughs> the pride.
price we gotta pay. Oh, yeah, I had to drive all the way to California in my Cadillac <laughs> to a conference. Sacrifice, sacrifice. <sighs> Can you imagine Paul and all these guys sitting looking at us? <laughs> kind of sliding their eyes side to side. Is this guy for real? It's time to get bloody, people. Let's make it worthwhile. If we're gonna, if we're gonna take the time, let's make it worthwhile. You know, we're not gonna gain friends. We're not gonna have a mega church, probably, or whatever like that. Let's, that's not gonna do it. But there's enough people in this room to effectively take this town and win it for Jesus Christ. With who we are, and 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 Rockland and and Gravelberg and wherever, all over the place. There's enough people right here. Like, like I'm telling you, 125 men turned into 100,000 converts in those days when everybody had to walk, when there was no food. They didn't have food. They didn't have shoes. They didn't have nothing. 1,200 preachers raised up from 100, uh, uh, pro, out of 100, uh, 125 people going to work. That's the picture that I see for the church. I, I don't see a, a, Christi a maintained Christianity. I see in a Christianity that's on the increase all the time. It should be common thing. When we lay out, when we lay out our, our dreams and our visions and our goals, it should be something that's beyond reach so that the one that can reach it can step in and help us. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And, when, and, and, and not to take things personal. When people fall away, don't take it personal. Oh, what did I do wrong and all that stuff. But I've done enough of that and I'm stopping it right now. The last month or so, I've just stopped it. I'm not questioning no more. I, I preached the message that I'm in, my men, I meant it, and I'm working very hard to say, I'm not going to ask God why anymore, no matter what. That's what I'm working at. I'm working at it, okay? <laughs> so if you hear me asking why, but this is a people, like all the people Jesus called, all the, and most of them, pretty well all of them, died a martyr's death, every one of them. You know, they were the, the, the world around them was hostile. They hated them, period. But they highly esteemed the early church. After Ananias and Sapphira bit the dust at that service, <laughs> nobody said, you know, we don't really want to join you. They're not going to join half-hearted. They didn't join half-hearted. They, they didn't come and say, well, I'm going to try this out. When Ananias and Sapphira bit the dust, there you go. Um, see you guys later. <laughs> that membership card you were filling out for me, put it in the shredder, please. Because I'm not ready for that. What kind of Christianity have we created? Other than a sissified Christianity. And I've been the sissy too. In time. But ever since I met you all, I've been getting more and more bolder and stuff like that. You know, serve God no matter what. There's none left at the end. <laughs> you know, but I, I plan, I want to see, I want to see Cinnaboyle saved. I want to see God come to church. I want to see people encounter the living God who walk in this church. If, if our people won't encounter God, let's, let's have it ready for the other people to come. When they walk in there, they encounter Him. They encounter the living God. And you know, when the early, the guys, the, the apostles and in the early church, the disciples, when they got persecuted, they counted it great joy. They counted it great joy that they could suffer for the name of Christ, carrying that name. Just think about it. You're carrying that name. Everything that you, everything you do, you're carrying that name. You know, I walk into that police station today. Oh, who are you? I'm, I'm the pastor of the Apostolic Church. And we help people. And we want that to come out. We want to give people a hope. There's a, you know, people slam the door. We, we become, we become so worldly minded. We're no heavenly good. 
You know, they, I, I hate that statement. They, you're so earthly, are you so heavenly minded? You're no earthly good. Where did that come from? It didn't come out of this book, because we're supposed to be heavenly minded. We're supposed to be thinking what think what the think tanks think in heaven. <laughs> Amen. And and so there we go. Here we are. It's a great time to be alive. It's a great weekend to be alive. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Where sin abounds, you walk into you walk around in confidence. There's a, there's a, gr- a good number of people here tonight that we can change, and everyone here has the ability. All you have to do is submit. Your life ain't over just because you hit the pension year. You know that's sixty-five, the magic number. The magic for what? For people to perish and drop off the face of the earth. It's basically what we tell what we're telling you. You're sixty-five. You go in the pasture. That's crazy. How do you expect people to live? I remember years ago. I read in. Uh, I, w- I used to read lots of statistics and stuff like that. And it was probably about fifteen years ago. They said that the average pensioner collects 17 checks in Canada. 17. What does that mean? They die after 17 months. Why? Because there's no vision, there's no purpose, there's no meaning. Everything in our society is geared for retirement, geared for that glory days down the road so that we can sit and do nothing and die. Doesn't fit in the kingdom. Yep. Yep. Bob and Shirley are getting busier as days go on. Right? They thought they were going to retire till they walked through that door Anybody else comes here with plans of retirement? <laughs> yeah, your career is just starting now. The real career, serving Jesus. The young people won't do it. We'll find somebody that will, right? Yeah. Colonel Sanders is, you know, I don't know where he was in his life, but he, he, he was bankrupt when he was 65 years old for the third time. He had something, some kind of pizzazz, you know? Think about that, 65, and then, then, then he got successful. <laughs> After 65, how many times did he try? Three times for sure. And it failed, but he never stopped. If only... The people of God could have that kind of tenacity. Just because something hasn't worked out. Oh, we better quit. We better change our vision. <laughs> let's change our vision. That didn't work, so let's try something else. No. Stay the course. We need God to come down. We need that, we need that resurrection power in our lives. The more, the more struggle that you go through, the more you begin, that's when you cry out to God more than ever. God, we're desperate for you. God, we trust you. God, we believe you. When everything looks like it's falling apart, everything around you looks like it's over, it's finished, you trust God even more. I trust you, Jesus. That's the trust, the commitment to the call. Commitment to the call. Every one of us needs to commit to the call. Rain or shine, Flood or no flood. He'll give you the strength. He'll give you the strength. He'll give you the strength. I was so tired last night, I could hardly see. But I woke up this morning, and I was good. You know, like, I was just like, wow, what is this? You know, <laughs> what is this all about? But anyway, I come to prayer anyway. I come, I don't, I don't let emotion, I don't let feeling, I don't let any of that stuff dictate to me. The anything. I'm going after God, whether my body wants to or not. Period. Commitment. Call to victory. The call to victory. I can't wait for Sunday for the, 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 the next message to this. And uh, 
And it's the culture of victory. What does it look like? What does it? What does this whole thing look like? What's it supposed to look like? We we're we're expecting it to be like the Stanley Cup final, where the winner carries the cup. Yay! Crowd cheering. Stephen was one of those victors that lived the, in the culture of victory, being pelted with stones in his last breath. Amen. It's a different world we live in. A lot of people don't understand. They they think I'm crazy. I am. <laughs> I'm out of my mind. More importantly, I'm out of your mind. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand.